I'm Becky Quick of CNBC and your host of The Forum. I'll be guiding you through exclusive conversations among some of the world's global leaders, conversations previously held behind club doors, but today we invite you in. The Economic Club of New York serves as the premier forum for nonpartisan discussion dedicated to connecting the world's brightest minds with preeminent public and private sector leaders. A nonprofit, 501c3, the club is a 115 year old platform for the conversations that help shape the future of our world. The Economic Club of New York, brightest minds, critical conversations, catalyst for innovation. Alex is the co-founder and CEO of Palantir Technologies, a company known for its cutting-edge data analytics and artificial intelligence-driven solutions. Since co-founding Palantir in 2003, he's played a pivotal role in shaping the company's vision, leading its expansion into both the government and commercial sectors. Under his leadership, Palantir has become a key player in national security, defense, and enterprise data management. As part of the club's author series, we're excited to delve into Alex's latest work, The Technological Republic, Hard Power, Soft Belief, and the Future of the, Ve- of the West, in a fireside chat with our moderator and chair of the Museum of Modern Art, Marie Jose Kravis. Thank you, Barbara. And Alex, thank you for being here. Thank um, you. And we are going to discuss the book. You talk about quantization of large language models and so on. What do you see as the new, the next frontier and how that ties into what you're doing? There's two parts of AI, which is AI that we work on. AI on the battlefield, which is how do you, how do you find adversaries? How do you predict what they're going to do? And how do you neutralize them with the least amount of unintended damage possible slash the least amount of damage done to your side uh, that is humanly or inhumanly possible. And like, then the, the reality of rationalization of every institution is you, in this country, like our central advantage over every other country in the world is software. Like, I don't think we're better at hardware than Russia or uh, China or any other country in the world that, uh, like, peer at. I mean, even, you know, Iran makes... They made very useful drones and have had a huge negative impact. So, but but then there's like, if you want to upscale the hardware we have and change the cost of going to market and make the reliability much greater, especially in a world where maybe things get disrupted, you're going to have to put everything into a software program and then use software, humans and AI to change change the economics. So you have... The battlefield targeting is going to move to smaller objects and AI and software. The objects that you use are going to be managed, produced, rationalized. The people working on building the objects are, in this country are going to be upscaled with AI and AI management things. So you can take people who are smart but maybe not engineers and make them perform as engineers. Uh, the ethics of our country are only manageable in software because you have questions we're not going to go out randomly and just destroy people we're, we need to know under what situation how do you decide when do you use lethal action how do you decide when not to how do you do it in a subset of a sonic environment where you you don't have a lot of time how do you use the vast intelligence resources we have to identify and target the people on the other side who are are credible adversaries while leaving the people alive who are moronic uh it ha- look, so that's the battlefield side and then, like in any endeavor, you want to work hard where the other side isn't very good or not as good as you. So that's obviously there are just there's there's like uh, that's and, and then there's lots of reasons why this is a software nation that are very hard for us to understand because we do it naturally. One of one of the things that I always looking for in, in like Palantir is known for being the best talent acquisition and manager in tech in the world. Um, and one of the things I'm always looking for are I want people to do things that they do naturally, and then I want to give them the hardest problem in the world. I don't want people to learn how to be good at something. I want someone who's great at something and learns how to be better. But you can apply that to software. Like you don't want to learn. I don't think we should learn to be good at something that our adversaries are are better at. We should learn to play our game, which is going to be hard, hybrid hardware software, and for lots of reasons. But also because the precursor of software is fairness, building communities around ideas, meritocracy, the fact that you get to keep 
the proceeds of your labor in equity, that it's fairly taxed, that, that it's not, you're not, not robbed from you, that we're able to integrate people from all different places in ways that, that other cultures struggle to do, uh, that we share knowledge. Would you like to be a part of the conversations at the Economic Club of New York? Learn more about membership, the New York City and National Fellows programs, and other opportunities for engagement in the club at www.econclubny.org. So I, I feel there's a big bifurcation between true and plausible. So I was right, and no one thought I was right. So here's a statement that is true and not plausible. We at Palantir want the best thing for this country. That is a true and not plausible statement because obviously I'm a large stakeholder in a company with very specific interests. Okay, so that is point one. Is, this, is it good for the country for us to pen test every single program and look, does it work? How well does it work? What are the unit economics of this program? And it, is it necessary? So is it good? I think everyone would say yes. Is it necessary? I would say yes. And I would say it's necessary because in the West, broadly speaking, so you're an expert in France culture, I'm a, a, a lay person, uh, but not completely lay person. Uh, and, but I am somewhat of an expert in like Germanic stuff. And it, it's, uh, it is necessary because we have a legitimation crisis in the West. No one, believe our, no one plausibly believes the institutions work to the point where if you were spending your own money, you'd keep financing them. And the people, so those institutions have to be pen tested. What are the unit economics of this institution? By the way, this is an inherently progressive view until recently. Progressives want things to work because how do you justify the spend if it's not working? That's the classically progressive position that's been abandoned by the progressives. Uh, and so, I want those systems and institutions to work because I believe that I will and we will do much better if things work than if they don't. So that's true and maybe not plausible. So now I'll get to plausible and true. It's good for Palantir. It's obviously good for Palantir. If you're in the business of creating value, like the Palantir, the history of Palantir basically is we build product. Everyone knows it's very good or the best, like PG, which no one even competes against anymore, which is the anti-terror product. And then people have 5,000 reasons not to buy it because they don't like me, because I'm too crazy, because the unit economics are too good and they displace people, or the European version because it's not German. And the single best thing that helps my company is meritocracy. P pen test everything. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. We have hundreds of contracts. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a contract that doesn't deserve to be renewed. Great. Maybe there's a contract that does deserve to be renewed that gets canceled. Pen test everything. Test the unit economics. Test the unit economics. And unit economics in this case also include general good, like the PG product stops terror attacks and augments civil liberties. It, so there's like, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a double good in there. So, you know, that's, why I think these things are structurally, and then I think there's a more subtle thing that's going on in the market, uh, which is interesting, which is we've been saying for two years, large language models are a commodity. Of course, we were laughed at. Of course, it's true. And, uh, and that you, the way you manage it is a software large language model hybrid, and that there's a lot of value in large language models. America's going to change because if they're, they're actually implemented correctly, you can vastly change the unit economics of a business. By the way, you know, judge, judge, as in the book, judge the company by and the institution and the people by the fruits they bear. You know, that's how you end up with a rule of 81 in our company. But that's proxy because other companies get that. And then what you see in various announcements recently is people are realizing, oh, maybe large language models unmanaged aren't that valuable. And just like in the DOD, then, then people are like, well, okay, well, if they're not as valuable, we'll reduce the valuation of everything. What I think at Palantir and what I would relate to this book, even there's a couple of reasons to read the book and many reasons maybe not to. But what I would say is that going back to Pareto optimality product and macro conditions, I am very happy with our position. <laughs> I, I am supremely skeptical of competitive thinking. Like at Palantir, like we are interested in how well does our product work. I'm supremely disinterested in 
how well, what someone else is doing. And last, not least, whatever you are unhappy with in the world now, if you go talk to your comrades in unhappiness, what you're going to find is they're going to be like, oh, it's a pendulum. The pendulum's going to swing back. I'm pretty skeptical in that the pendulum's swinging back. So like, it's like, it's things, time is accelerating. The impact of these things are accelerating to the point where, you know, you can't fight the macro thing. You can, ch you can change the trajectory by getting on board. So if you're, if you're trying to do whatever you're trying to do, reform your insurance company or pull hydrocarbons out of the earth in a cheaper, safer, more effective way, or build batteries uh, where the battery manufacturing happened in Japan and now it has is happening in America where your engineers are smart but they haven't been at your company for 30 years and they're, they're not actually career engineers whose parents also worked at the company. Or if you're building cars with supply chains that are complex and all sorts of things that are complex, um, you can assume that the way of doing this without actually effective uh, AI enhanced software will allow you to compete, but you're assuming that while the person down the street is actually doing this correctly. And, and, and like overnight you will find, or within a quarter, you will see your unit economics are different. And if you wait two or three quarters, you will not be able to catch up. And so I think a lot of these things that are like, you know, where we assume, I mean, this is a thing I've been screaming at my, you know, I have a lot of friends and family in Germany. It's like the pendulum is not swinging back. You, you must have a tech scene. Like, we are blessed. We have the most important tech scene in the world at the most important time in the world to have it. But you, I mean, you talk about those strengths and American leadership and also, but you also deplore in the book the fact that U.S. society, Silicon Valley, has become somewhat rudderless, soft. How do the two play? Um, How do the two well, interact? Well, if something does not create value, uh, you will find pretty quickly that people stop believing in it. And one of the my very important experiences for me that I, is not exactly captured in the book was when I was a very poor student in uh, Germany, there was a little village I went to visit because of, of a dear friend of mine knew the family there, lived there. And I was like, they gave me a coat. I was really, I was, I, you know, I was very happy, but very poor. And, um, and so in that, in, in Frankfurt, talk to all these people. And the early days, the reason why they adopted democracy and kind of values that I think all of us would ascribe to was they figured out that these values actually would allow them to make their society work better, uh, be more ethical, would make them wealthier, was better for them, it would prevent war. Um, you must deliver the goods economically. No order will survive in, in, without a delivery function that is where people, their lives are improved, and there is nothing noble in embracing values and ideas that have never worked. And one of the things I tell my progressive friends, like hyper, that don't want to talk to me, that are still thinking about a career in academia, is like, great, well, tell me an institution you believe is good that is actually working. So you're no, no longer progressive? Well, I think I'm the only last real progressive, which is like, you know, but I, I yeah, I, I, I believe in progress. <laughs> it's like, but, you know, uh, but the, the point I'm making is the movement, it, any movement that does not deliver actual value, objective value. And again, I would, and I have most of my family are academics and I'm like, what institution do you believe is both good? and is working where the unit economics are such that they're in any way comparable to anything you would buy yourself. You've been listening to The Forum by the Economic Club of New York, a nonprofit 501c3 dedicated to connecting the world's brightest minds for critical nonpartisan conversations. Be sure to subscribe now to be alerted to future new episodes. Would you like to be a part of the conversation at the Economic Club of New York? Learn more about membership, the New York City and National Fellows programs, and other opportunities for engagement in the club at www.econclubny.org. I'm your host, Becky Quick. Thanks for listening.